Okay, so today we are going to start the transition from programming on a terminal <coughs> to programming on a browser. Okay, uh, right now we use the Node uh, interpreter basically to get familiar with the JavaScript language and constructs uh, and philosophy basically also. Uh, where you know, we, we learned some peculiar ways uh, of, of programming and of doing asynchronous stuff. Uh, on Node, the asynchronous stuff is mostly related with input-output uh, um, operations, you know, where you have to interact with something external. Because actually, with the kind of uh, application we are doing, there is no user interaction. Okay? When we move to the browser, we see that we'll, there will be a lot more of sources uh, of asynchronous uh, events and information, uh, and that's why okay, we, we have to be uh, quite familiar with that. But let's go one step at a time. Huh? So uh, the plan for next week is today uh, to get familiar with the, the web environment, uh, basically the, the static stuff. So we'll uh, play for this week. Uh, so this lecture, this class, and uh, the lab of this week, uh, uh, just with the HTML and CSS. Hmm? Um, that was, uh, let's try to put in practice and, and see together something about uh, the readings we gave, we've been giving you and some more on-depth on knowledge about that. Hmm? Um, next week, uh, uh, we'll uh, add JavaScript to the picture. So we'll add interactivity on the browser uh, on top of the HTML and CSS pages that we've been designing this week. Mm -hmm. So we'll learn what it means to uh, write JavaScript code that runs in the browser instead of running into Node.js. Mm -hmm. And that would give us a, a rough idea mm -hmm. of what it looks like uh, to uh, program an interactive application on the browser with uh, native technologies. So basic, uh, the basic uh, APIs of a browser and the basic JavaScript language. Mm -hmm. And we want to spend a lot of time doing that, so just one week, uh, basically to, to understand the basic mechanism and to get a flavor of the problems that arise, of the difficulties that uh, uh, arise when we are trying to organize uh, all the code and organize all the data and uh, synchronize all the different parts of the page by working just with the uh, JavaScript language. That's why from the week after that, so in three weeks from today, uh, we will uh, start uh, over again, uh, basically with uh, uh, learning the framework React. Uh, that, uh, again, is uh, writing JavaScript in, brow in the browser, but uh, in inside a, a library, inside a framework uh, that already does a lot of the low-level stuff for us. A lot of the automates a lot of stuff uh, for us. Okay, so um, these couple of weeks are to get familiar with the environment and to understand uh, uh, what are the main issues in programming inside the browser. Okay, I brought out this picture from the slide. I'm not uh, showing you all uh, the slides that have been publishing um, yesterday or the day before. I don't remember. Um, we we'll just pick some of them no, that help me uh, you know, touch some important topics. Uh, um, basically, the content of the slides are mirroring the contents of the of the tutorials. Uh, we've uh, um, uh, asked you to to, to look uh, on the Mozilla Development Networks. Uh, so that these are just the first steps. Uh, maybe uh, some of you already knew some of the stuff. Uh, so um, we 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 don't want to you know, spend too much time time to with extremely simple stuff. Uh, I think it's better maybe to spend the time together in making an exercise together and see how this uh, information fits. Hmm? But basically, assume uh, we assume that you already at least read <laughs> uh, without uh, sleeping, uh, falling asleep, uh, um, the, the, these, these tutorials. Okay, let's start from the general architecture. So basically, what we are. What the, uh, the kind of architecture we are playing with, uh, in general, is will be something like this. Hmm? So every web application is uh, uh, an application split uh, into two separate uh, parts. Uh, one running on the browser, we call it the front end, and the other running on the server, uh, we call it back end. 
and these two applications are totally separate and they communicate only through they may communicate basically only through one channel which is this uh, uh, request response uh, exchange protocol that runs on http mm, on the http protocol so there are two different environments some code here runs into a browser some code there runs into a web server that may be written in any programming language can be maybe totally unrelated from that okay um, they the two environments don't share any variable, don't share any information, unless the information that is explicitly exchanged through this channel. Uh, and this was the, the picture of the web since, uh, since forever, since uh, 25 years, or since it was invented. Okay? Um, what does the server can do? Well, basically, the server can um, publish an application. It means that the, the, the uh, website, it means that the server can host the files, the HTML file, for example, that constitute, uh, that represent a given web page. Okay, the browser is only used to browse uh, and to see the content of a web page, and this page would be stored, must be stored into some server. So when we point our browser to a web address, we are actually contacting through HTTP the server. And the server will reply us back uh, with in the HTTP response uh, with the, the, the body, uh, the content of an HTML uh, file. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the, the basic function of the server, uh, being able to provide uh, HTML content to the browser so that the browser may display it. Mm -hmm. So it's the basic level. Uh, actually, how how can the browser, uh, the server, provide us with uh, an HTML page? Well, there are two ways. Either this HTML page is handcrafted, or somebody wrote it and stored it somewhere in the file system of the web server. So the web server can just pick the file and send it back to the browser, to the browser that requested it. Or, and which is the normal case, um, this HTML content is generated dynamically by a software running on the server that knows uh, wh how to compose the specific HTML page that contains information for you, and not a generic file that is already stored there. And for doing that, uh, we already have a split between the web server itself, which is a standard module, software module, that is able to handle the HTTP protocol. That would be enough uh, to serve a static file because I request a file, okay, the file is there, I give it to back. I give it back to you in the response. But if this file doesn't exist and must be generated dynamically, I need some software, some application, some logic uh, in order to, to build that. And that cannot be standard. This is, will be our application logic that will create that specific uh, content on the fly at every request. And that's why a web server in, uh, always contains some container for running application logic in one of many different possible languages. Okay, so these are the, the layers. And this application logic, how can that create the response? How can that create a web page? But well, basically, usually, it access some information from a database that contains the information it needs to build the portions of the page. OK, we are doing the exercise together of the scores of your exams. So somewhere in the database, we have the list of the exams and their scores. And they can be used to put the right information into the right lines of a table, for example. So this application logic usually gets a request, give me a web page with the with a list of exams. This application does a couple of queries onto the database to get information it needs creates the HTML file with that information inside and returns it to the browser. Um, that, that information, that, that web page, is returned to the browser and is immediately forgotten or deleted from the server itself. So the server immediately forgets anything it did because it already completes its mission. When the server receives a request, the only mission is to provide a response and then forget about that. We'll come to this forgetting uh, 
a topic uh, uh, later on when we deal with the, with the web server. Okay, so that's the minimum amount of information that the, uh, the amount of operation that the server can do. And on the browser side, okay, if it were 20 years ago, I would just say the browser will just simply visualize and format the content of this HTML file and show it to the user. When the browser were only a, a tool you know, for displaying HTML content. But today, or since a lot of time, a long time, uh, the browsers also contain some uh, say JavaScript interpreter. So what it means is that uh, once the HTML page has been loaded into the browser, the, uh, the content of the page can also evolve, change, be modified by some code running in JavaScript inside the browser itself. So basically, the browser uses three different languages, you know, is able to understand three different languages. The first two are for describing the content of the page. HTML is for the content itself, and style sheets uh, are for the layout, colors, effects, uh, and so on. And that's the, basically the hard part are style sheets uh, to, to get right. And then we have the JavaScript code that may operate on the page. This JavaScript running on the browser will see, will, this will be the topic of next week, uh, will see the content of the current page and be able to manipulate it freely, totally free. Whenever this JavaScript code runs, the, say, server is long gone. So the server only provided the information, and then the JavaScript runs on its own on the browser. Hmm? This is the, the basic model. Um, and where does this JavaScript come from? It may only come from here. But the browser doesn't know what kind of manipulations to do with your page that you're navigating. This, the JavaScript should be embedded and linked inside the web page. So the web page will lead the, the content, the styles that are needed to show it nicely, and the JavaScript code that will be needed to make it interactive. So let the user uh, add or change or modify parts of the content. Uh, this is what we are doing these two weeks, uh, learning to see how the JavaScript code is able to interact with the browser in order to read the content of the page, understand what the user is doing with their mouse and keyboard on the page, and reacting uh, correctly. And this would be only half of the story, because uh, imagine, uh, okay, you have uh, your list of examples. Always to do the same example. So I connect to the server, the home page server, and the browser asks uh, the server for the home page. The home page will be the list of the examples. Right. We, are, we have a web, a web application with only one page. And the response will be an HTML with the current scores that the server, the application logic running the server just pulled out of the database. And this will be shown on the user screen. And with the, thanks to the JavaScript code running on the browser, the user can maybe modify some scores, delete some one, and add a new score, and so on. So the JavaScript will be able to modify the content of the table that is shown to the user. But this would be all for nothing, because we will be modifying only data stored here in the browser, in the local memory of the browser code. What we need to do is to update the real content, the real information, uh, back on the database. <coughs> but as we said, there's no continuous connection uh, uh, with the server. The server already forgot that it gave us this information. So actually, what we need to build is a second, a sort of a second channel by which a, a running application on the browser may be able to manipulate data on the server. And for doing that, we will we'll reuse this HTTP channel in a different way. So the HTTP channel has been designed you know, 25 years ago to deliver HTML pages. And that's fine for that. But when we are dealing with the interactive application, 
we will reuse the same protocol also to give commands or to give instructions, to call procedures or to exchange data with, an, with a remote application logic. So part of this logic on the server would be to create the HTML pages. And that's the static part. Part of the code running on the server would be to exchange data between the front-end application and the back-end logic. And so when the user adds a new score here, it clicks on the Add button. That score may be immediately shown here, right? It's easy. And then the browser would need to send a request to the server saying, OK, please add this score for this user in your database, because it has been added in the, in the, in the cloud. And uh, this kind of request is not the request of a new web page for navigating to a new web page. It's just uh, talking directly to my server application logic. So basically, we have two parts of our applications. One is the front end itself, and the other is sort of a back end um, endpoints that may be called. Normally, we, we say that the server will publish an API, an application programming interface, that can be called with several methods that can be called by the, by the browser. So it will be, uh, say, an, an extra challenge for us to keep in mind that our web application will mostly run on the front end that will manage all the interaction with the user. But we also have a part running on the back end that we need to be keep uh, synchronized with. We need to keep in sync. So if it, wasn't, if it wasn't enough to manage all the asynchronous behavior here and, and all the asynchronous behavior there, just remember that the two needs to talk and synchronize. Mm -hmm. That makes it fun. So this is another picture. I, we will build uh, into this picture one step at a time. Okay. So the API on the server will be much later in the course. Uh, right now, we'll, focus, we'll try to focus for some weeks uh, or four or five weeks uh, for these two and the first week of React uh, or exclusively on the, on the front end, on the project. Okay. So, we know that the server exists, but we'll learn how to power it up uh, uh, later on. Okay? But just to have the, the big picture and the, the end point. And uh, so the easy part of, uh, of, um, of the browser is actually the HTML language. Hmm? HTML can be basically learned in 10 minutes, hmm? at least the, the, main points, uh, the main points of it. Hmm? Uh, and it's basically a text. Uh, language used for describing and formatting uh, mostly textual content uh, with maybe some images or some links or some uh, say interactive elements in that. Mm -hmm. So for example, we could try, uh, what is that? Okay, as a, as a first step uh, today, to try to create uh, a possible web page in HTML that may contain our like a list of scores, okay? We still use the, that example because we are already familiar with the data. Mm -hmm. So let's put that uh, in a web page. How would you organize that? And uh, we'll try to design this web page by trying to, what we call in the slides, it was called the modern HTML. Uh, the modern way of, uh, of creating web pages is to try to keep uh, as separated as possible the content and the presentation. So what goes into the page should be kept separate from how it should be displayed, meaning colors, alignments, fonts, and something like that. That will be managed by style sheets. So first, let's create a raw content. It will be ugly. It will be black and white. It would be not nice to look at. And then we will add styles to uh, that content in a separate way, in a separate step. So let's try to keep them separated. Uh, the first step, creating the content, is really easy. So what we should do is to create something like, I hope that this would work, but it doesn't. So in this classroom, there's nothing really work uh, of the equipment that we have here. So I wanted to make a sketch uh, um, of, of the kind of interface we are thinking of. 
but basically when I'm thinking at a table that contains the scores with maybe a title on top of, of, of that. And um, this table will have uh, maybe some controls later on that we may add later on for adding or deleting or editing the exams in our in our table. So let's let's create it one one piece at a time. Uh, we might just create a, we can just create a new file. Let's call it the default name for this, uh, the home page of website usually is index.html, if I can write it correctly. Hmm. We create a new file, and every HTML file has already has a pretty fine structure. Okay, that uh, if I write uh, uh, usually in Visual Studio Code, if you do the control space completion when you write HTML, it already creates a skeleton for you with the basic uh, mandatory elements uh, of, of the HTML uh, page. So we, are, we all know that an HTML5 is composed of a head element and a body element, and all the content of the page goes into the body, while the head contains mainly metadata or information about the page. Mm -hmm. uh, it contains a title that is shown on top of the browser. Uh, it contains some, inf well, some metadata that, for the moment, we don't really understand, but we trust uh, um, the, the, the snippet that has been generated. <clears throat> and uh, in the as section in this uh, say snippet that has been created by Visual Studio Code, we have two different links uh, that uh, try to pull some information into this HTML page. Of course, we can customize all of this uh, with the file names that we prefer, and we can make delete whatever we don't need, and so on. But this is just an example, say, saying that uh, uh, any HTML page usually can contain, can link can load some style sheets written in, TSA, in the CSS language that uh, will define which styles will be applied to the content uh, that we are creating in the body. So for now, we don't have any main CSS file to load. And so this instruction will do nothing. We we'll try to load a file that doesn't exist for the moment. We will create it later. And we, any page can load some scripts written in JavaScript that would run after the page is loaded to make it dynamic uh, to add additional behavior to that. This will be next week's work. So for today, I'm going to comment that uh, because we don't, uh, yeah, we are not learning to do that today. So the goal of today will be to create a page and style it uh, correctly. Let's go, say, easy with, with the first part. Um, we have a bunch of uh, uh, tags uh, of elements in HTML. OK, for example, here we have in, in the slides, uh, here some, where is that? Some example of the HTML elements. Uh, and basically, they fall, they fall into different categories. Uh, some elements are used for grouping and sectioning and organizing the content of the page, and some other are for generating the actual content. So we may have, uh, uh, let's uh, not get lost in the specific uh, meaning of these words, uh, uh, we may have uh, no, uh, different uh, tags uh, for creating titles. Uh, or for creating uh, sessions. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a, a group of tags that are able to delimit a part of a page. And these tags actually don't create anything, don't create anything visible. They are only containers for some other text that will generate actually some text, will generate some image, will generate some bullet list, or something like that. But apart, the content is not. Uh, is, 
it's a, of course what we want to put in the page, but this content should be organized. And so there are uh, all of these uh, tags that help us to delimit parts of the page. We'll see how, it's, how, how important it is to, to give a good uh, grouping of the element of the page, not just throw everything in the body, but add good uh, sections. Uh, because the, with the style sheets, we will apply a given style sheet, uh, given, given color, given the background to different parts of the page. So we need uh, not only to, have the, to create the picture that we want, we need to create some sort of invisible containers so that different styles can be applied to different parts uh, of the container. So this, for example, uh, gives us an idea of the possible organization of a web page. So inside the body, we would have uh, this structure. Maybe we have a header part and a main part, uh, possibly a footer and something put aside that gives us the so the usual um, structure of a web page. If I try to, we will try no? to, to organize our um, web page with this uh, structure, what we see will not be this organization, but just a sequential organization. Let's do that to, to understand. So in the body, let's try to copy that. No? Okay, uh, copying this slide, it means we have a header section with a nav inside. Okay, header. Nav. And is this nav, I could say that navigation. Uh, I can put some text just to show what is there. Then we have an aside section with the left column. And then we may have a main section, right? Okay, the main content here. And finally, a footer. So we are describing with this high level text, structuring text, what is the main structure of the page. And what happened? Yeah. Back it larger? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Is that enough? Thank you. Um, so uh, if we open this file, what we see, so let's open the file from here. For index.html. Okay, it's here. It's not as nice as we would like. This is an example of the separation between the content and the style. All these tags that we added were just containers. They are delimiting some portion of a page but they have no style information attached. There's no default styling. They don't do anything to the text. They don't make the text bolder. They don't make the text green or anything else. That will come by applying the style sheets to the page where we will see that maybe the body, the main content has a, I don't know, pink background or something like that. Okay. Um, HTML comes uh, with a lot of uh, possibilities for organizing and styling the content, but by default, it doesn't do any of that. It gives you the possibility of applying the styles later. All these sectioning comments that we are no, suggested to use actually do the same thing, which is nothing. They don't know anything real about the content of the page. But they give us a place to customize it. A name, a tag, an element, a group of, of a part of the page that we are able to customize it later. Basically, all these tags uh, that we see here 
uh, are all synonyms that do all the same thing as a generic uh, tag which is called div. Uh, a div is a uh, uh, was born uh, as the first section element. Uh, um, this stands for division. So division a portion of a page. So let's delimit this portion of the page from here to there. What do I do? Why do I delimit this part of the page? And what do I do with that part of the page differently from another part? It's up to me later on. The div tab doesn't do anything special at all. It just uh, delimits a part of the page. Uh, these other sectioning tags are equivalent to div. They don't do anything special. They only give us some information to the programmer that reads the page saying, okay, probably, uh, I, okay, I don't have the main section here. I don't, um, the nav section is just a division of the page that I will use for navigation elements. Just sort of documentation, calling a section with a proper name. But then it doesn't do anything by default. It doesn't create a navigation element. It doesn't create the last column. It gives you a, a space where you can fill the content that will go into the last column. And later on, with the style sheets, you have to transform it actually in a, in a column. So uh, we have something in mind here. We have a visual goal to reach, but we must reach it in steps. First steps is curating the content and uh, separating the different parts uh, of our page. So, for example, if we go into the code here, um, in the main, what what will the main content uh, be in our case? It will be probably a title, and the title with a in the HTML is a heading. Say my my score, for example, followed by table hmm? of the scores themselves, followed by a table element, which uh, in uh, creating an, a table in, in HTML means uh, defining rows and cells inside the rows. Hmm? So uh, there's a lot, a whole, whole language. No? Uh, uh, to, to define the structure of the page. Uh, a table is made usually of a table heading head and a table body. We have some headings in the table and some content in the table itself. The table head in our case will contain one row. PR means for table row. And the row contains some cells. Cells can be table data cells or table heading cells. In, this, in our case, the first row will contain headings. And so we are going to put, uh, uh, for example, the name, the uh, score, and the date of an exam as table headings and at least uh, one row for example in the body that will contain three cells name is uh, web applications the score would be table data 30 and the data would be Today. So this is a quite a lengthy description for a simple table with uh, one title row and one content row. And uh, okay, we by knowing the HTML tags, we will learn how to tables, how to create uh, uh, lists, uh, so the unnumbered lists or lambda lists, uh, uh, 
uh, we know how to create citations, we know how to create paragraphs, to, to put text into bold, italics, and so on. Okay, all the formatting texts that are available um, in, in, um, in the HTML language. And if we reload this page, we see that the main body has been replaced by this title, this ugly big title. So the, the real size would be this one. I just zoomed the, the window to make it easier to read. So this will be the title, the H1 title, and this will be the table itself. It's a table because things are aligned. It doesn't have by default any grid lines to separate them. Or let, let's, we don't care for the moment whether it's ugly or not. We must care for the content first, okay? And, uh, and which is the, the easy part. Uh, basically, uh, by default, the, the cells with the table heading are being uh, shown in uh, in both face and centered across the column, while the table data are being shown the, uh, in normal font uh, and left aligned. Mm -hmm. That's the def default rendering for the browser. All of this rendering, the alignment, the fonts, the bold face, and so on, can be changed when we apply style sheets. Okay, so that's basically the default that nobody uses. Mm -hmm. It has so an uh, old look, hmm? but at least it defines the content. In the browser, and we are, when we are working in the browser, there's a very good friend that we should always use, which is the, the inspector. Right now, I'm using, the in this case, Firefox, but also Chrome, also Edge, also Safari. They all have a window in the uh, developer mode uh, that gives you access to all kind of information about uh, what you are doing uh, actually the space is never enough uh. so for example we have a window here that where we can show and inspect uh, the content of the html page that we just created in the browser inside the browser and uh, if i uh, highlight uh, some portion of the HTML code, it will show me, you know, highlight in, in the page uh, what is actually that part of the page, what, what it corresponds to. So, for example, this 30 here is a TD element that corresponds to that cell. And the other way around, uh, if I want to check which part of the HTML code generates a given element, I can just inspect, uh, click the inspector here, click on the element, and it will bring me to the source code for that element. And for every element, I have a lot of information that we'll study in a moment uh, about that element, uh, about uh, the layout and the font and the, and the properties of all these uh, elements. Mm. Um, so it's a, it's a way you know, to, to go understand and debug uh, the HTML code itself. OK. So let's maybe try to add a couple more lines here. And then we can start thinking about uh, the style. So let's say software engineering. Change date and the mountain to two, thirteen, whatever. And another will be. It will be last year. Whatever. So I reload the page and see some more information into this table. Okay, we just learned how to create content, and content goes into sections. And some sections are contained, like we had a table. Some section, sorry, I lost the file. Contain just uh, uh, paragraphs of text, uh, 
p is a container that is just used for a line of text or for paragraph uh, of normal text uh, unnumbered list uh, numbered list uh, uh, figures uh, and so on so we have different tags for creating different types of context uh, right now we, we already started with the one of the most complex ones the, which is the table uh, which is already actually uh, on three levels we have all these um, tags here uh, that are that may be used to, to create content uh, For example, I stands for italics, uh, or M stands for emphasized, which is actually, uh, they do the same. They add slanted text to the um, um, slanted format uh, to the text. A is for a link, stands for anchor, or for creating links. Uh, B is for bold, and so on. So some of them are more useful than others. Uh, a button, we create a button. That we have to push so that we put we are going to put content on the page by knowing and say which tags do what there's also one interesting uh, tag which is called span that is equivalent uh, it is very similar to div huh? it's a tag that does nothing by itself but it may be customized through style sheets uh, or maybe uh, anchor point for javascript code so we'll have a lot of Content that, we, that we, we can already format with predefined text, plus we can have, we can, we can use, we will use a lot of div and span just to mark portion of the, of the page that we want to do something with later on. Hmm. It's very difficult to understand now what portion, which portions we want to mark because maybe we don't want to do, some, do something later on with style sheets. So it's always an incremental work okay we want to do something so we need to section it uh, to have a section for it so that we can apply a style to that um, and there will be also some interactive content that we can put uh, basically buttons uh, input elements so text where you can type uh, number type of text select a date uh, or something like that select it for a drop down menu and not no more so we see that maybe there are 200 or so tags in html we are going to use maybe 15 the most frequent ones because the structure basically is always the same this is an example of, of tables that gives you an idea of the of the main text okay this is for the html code Let, now let's try to move on and understand how to apply a style to this code, okay? Which is the interesting part. Um, style sheets. Applying styles to a, to a page means uh, creating a style sheet file, like this main.css, and loading the file with the rules, okay? So we, we read from, from the readings that every style sheet, uh, every uh, CSS file is a set of rules. And a set of rules, uh, and every rule is made of a selector and some properties that have been set. Let's see that in practice. For example, we already have this uh, loading of the main CSS file into this page. So we just have to create a new file called main.css and start writing stuff inside. And this stuff will be applied to the content of our page when it's loaded. So the browser will load the HTML file, see the link inside the heading, the header part of the file. And since when you see the link, it will try to load the CSS file and apply the rules in that. So the main CSS is a set of rules. A rules is made of a, a set a selector. A selector, there are many types of uh, CSS selectors that uh, uh, are used to apply different algorithms uh, to highlight some part of the code. So when think, thinking about CSS, we should think about the HTML file, 
press the browser, that we see here as a tree of nodes. Okay, imagine this is a data structure on the right with all the nested elements. It's a tree-like data structure. And uh, the CSS selectors are able to select a subset of nodes in this tree. And there are different filters for selecting these nodes. Okay, the easiest filter is the element name, the type of tag. So, for example, we only have one H1, which is that, the title there. So, when maybe it's a title, we want to make it red. So, in CSS, we first create a selector that will match that part of the page that we want to modify, and then the rules for modifying it. So, modifying the color of the title means tapping the selector. The simplest type of selector is just the name of a tag. So, selector H1 will match all the H1 elements in the page. A selector called uh, TD will match all the uh, data cells in all the tables in the page. So, it will apply to all the elements with that name. And then a rule in braces to apply to this element. In this case, we want to make it red, for example. So think of the H1 node, or each node, as an object with a lot of properties. What is H1 here? It's a node with a lot of properties. I just pulled up this show DOM properties for the inspector. As again, I'm using here Firefox, but Chrome is very similar. and. Uh, and these are, imagine this is an object, uh, and we'll learn how to use this as an object when working with JavaScript. We, it will be a JavaScript object. But for the moment, just imagine that it's a part of the page uh, that has uh, a whole lot of properties. And each property has a different effect on the behavior and on the appearance of the element. For example, one of the properties that I see here is, uh, I don't see it here. Yeah, it's uh, style, 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 yeah. Style, which is a property with a lot of sub-properties, a real lot of sub-properties, and all these Sub-properties inside styles can be customized one by one using CSS, can be changed by style sheets. And uh, CSS is a very say, simple, as a simple course, the mechanism of CSS is very simple, but the effects you can reach are very complex because they depend on the interaction of, of the effect of all these attributes that, uh, you know, uh, some elements are some attributes, some others, uh, and it gets, mm, it gets very complicated. But what we are doing with style sheets is selecting a set of, say, in computer, uh, in, uh, in algorithmic terms, is selecting a, a group of nodes with a selector and uh, going into the style property of these nodes and changing some of these properties according to what we write in the braces. What is the effect of changing a property will depend on the Layout algorithms uh, inside the browser. So in practice, we are we want to change the color. So there is a color property on basically every CSS node that uh, um, sorry, every HTML node that will control the um, tech the color of the text included inside that element. And we want to make it red, for example. And if we save this CSS file and go back to the browser and reload the page, we see that uh, now the title is red. 
Okay? We didn't accomplish very much, but at least it's the basic mechanism. And we see in the inspector here that uh, this element, uh, when I select this element, uh, it will tell me that there is a rule coming from main.css that applied uh, this property color red uh, to this element, h1. So actually, we have a lot of rules. I have a lot of, of properties, but the inspector here, by, by default, will only show me the, those properties that I have explicitly changed through my CSS. It doesn't show me all the list as we saw before, because most of them will be just a default value and don't show us anything useful. Mm -hmm. And we can also I say play with that. So, so in the browser, say, okay, what happens if this rule is not applied? Can I, I can enable, disable it just in the browser for, for debugging purposes. If I want to change it for real, I need to change it uh, on the um, on the um, on the CSS file and reload the page. Every modification I do here, I can also try to change the, the attribute. So it's an interactive. This inspector is uh, actually not only to inspect the content but also to change it. Maybe it can be easy if I want to experiment with that here, and then. Okay, I can copy this what I wrote here and put it back into the CSS file to make it permanent. So maybe I want also to to create a, a, a new a, to change the background color of this element. So, for example, a property is called background color, and we make it I don't know yellow. It's just very ugly, but uh, this is visible. And we see that in real time, when we are changing a rule, that rule immediately applies, uh, in this case, to all the H1 elements we have in the page. So we like it. Say we like it. Uh, we can just copy that uh, in the, in the, uh, that's a way to select all, so copy rule. So we make it here and reload the page. And by the way, if we had in the HTML page another H1 element, maybe at the after the table, the same styles would be also applied to that second element. Do you want to make this style uh, the text right aligned? There will be a text alignment property. You make uh, to change the font, uh, there will be a font uh, uh, face uh, property, and so on. And there are really hundreds of properties in CSS. This is where where we usually get lost. Okay. The easier selector was H1. Okay, all the elements with this tag are affected by this set of rules. And what if I want to select only some of them? I only want to select the first one, not the second one. Uh, well, I need a way in the HTML code to mark the two in a different ways. There are three ways of selecting a specific element or a specific group of elements. The rules are more complicated, but in my mind, I, I see basically three ways. One, by the location. Two, by name, ID, by giving us an explicit name to each of them. And three, by class, by giving a group uh, of, of elements as the same name. Uh, what do you mean? By, by position. Uh, in this case, we have uh, uh, H1 is contained into this main section. Maybe I have an H another H1, sorry, let, let me move it into the footer. Okay. So there are the same element, H1, but one is a child of main and the other is a child of footer. 
So I can, right now, they are, of course, equivalent. If I load, they do the same thing. But they can change the rules by saying that uh, when I have an H1 inside the main, then it should have a background color. Let's make it ugly green. So in this case, we have a compound selector where we have a, a sequence of selectors, and uh, it governs the nesting of these selectors. So actually, this rule, I have it here, only applies to, you see, main, I, I, can I can make it larger? Yes, a bit. Applies to main H1, means the H1 elements that the, the rules applies to H1 that falls inside a main. And then these rules apply to all the H1s. And actually, we have one element that will match both rules, this one. And what we see here, it will tell us, and the inspector will tell us that uh, uh, when we select this node, okay, we are selecting this node here, and it's telling me that uh, this rule and element will match both rules, but the second property is tried out. It's not applied because it has been uh, redefined by another more specific rule. So that's uh, what the S in CSS stands for, or what the C in CSS stands for. These are style sheets, uh, these are, but uh, they are cascading style sheets. You are applying some styles on top of other styles, on top of other styles, and so on. And every, every time you apply something more specific, it will override the previous declarations. Sorry, not the previous, the other declarations. It doesn't matter the order. It does not apply the operations in order of the CSS file. They, uh, there, are, there are rules uh, over, over override of cascading that will tell us uh, which rules uh, are able to override others. But the, the rules themselves are complex. They fill two pages of, uh, uh, of small text in the documentation. But the general idea is that the more specific rules uh, wins over the more general rules. And specific may mean different things, uh, but intuitively it's quite easy to get. So we are applying to something to all the H1s and something more to do these H1s that have something more specific. For example, this position. Then, so uh, we said the, the, the way of distinguishing between different elements, uh, everyone with the same name, but different roles is the position. Where does it happen? The second uh, way of identifying an element is to give it a specific name, an ID. I identify specifically one element in the page. Hmm? So for example, the navigation bar, I want to format it in a specific way. And uh, I can, sorry, where is it here? This navigation bar may, okay, in this case, I have a nav element, which is the only one used in this page, so I could use the selector. But that's for the sake of, uh, of uh, uh, description. To specify or to, uh, um, yeah, to give a name to a specific element in the page, we can use the ID attribute on the HTML element. ID will just create an identifier, not bar, just your name that you're assigning to this element. And in this way, you can select with the selector in CSS only that specific element with that specific name. 
how well the selector for selecting in a specific element is using the hash symbol. So selector hash name bar, we select an element with ID name bar, um, not bar. Maybe we want to invert the color so we can make the background color um, gray and the text uh, white. So we have this effect of the bar on the top. And maybe we can make the font a little larger, uh, font size larger. We'll apply some. 10% more in the size, and uh, maybe the font uh, family, uh, sounds very. I'm changing some attributes, OK? Don't worry if you, if you don't know them by heart. Uh, just I'm changing some properties, because I know it will change the way this navigation bar looks. The font, the background, and the text color. Maybe I should also change the margins there because you see that this is not really a navigation bar because it should go up to the edges of the browser itself. But we should also play on the, we'll see that in a moment. Uh, right now, we are only change, changing or playing with the properties of any specific element, but we are not changing any. In any way, the layout of the page is still a vertical block. Later on, we'll play, we'll see a bit more details about the properties for, for arranging the layout and playing with margins, alignments, and so on. That's the, one of the, the, the difficult parts. Hmm? So the ID in uh, the HTML code identifies a unique element into the page. An ID should be, must be unique inside the HTML page. You cannot, we cannot have two elements with the same ID. It's not supposed to work. Of course, it will not destroy your computer if you have two elements with the same ID, but the result is unpredictable. And so we can apply some effect only to some of the elements. But also only one of the elements. And of course, uh, every element inside that. So inside this navigation bar, maybe we have uh, different elements, different uh, buttons, maybe different text. And uh, the style applied to an element will be inherited by all the children along the chain. So when we apply something on a node, it will be inherited by all of them. We see that, for example, if we I did uh, the, the main content or, yeah, main content. content. Yeah. Main content. Yeah. And uh, let's go to CSS and change something on the ID of the main content. So maybe let's make it blue. So we change the attribute uh, sorry, that didn't work, uh, main content, color blue. Save. Save. Okay, I didn't save the HTML file. So I applied the color attribute uh, to the main node and the same attribute has been applied to the H1 and the table and to all the table data and so on uh, nodes into that. Okay, so you, you are, we have an element we selected right now, maybe a table cell here. And this table cell will apply this rule color blue inherited from main ID main content. So the cascading goes in different directions. 
different rules overwrite each other, and the inner nodes inherit the properties of uh, outer containers. So a good rule positioned in the right place uh, will apply to a whole um, portion of the page. And what if I want to maybe make uh, all the name of the courses here in uh, italics? Well, I have three of them. All of them are table data elements, but I cannot target the table data element because also the score and the data are table data. There is no special position in there because they all are contained inside the table body and inside the table rows. So I could give an ID to the three of them but they should be three different IDs and should require three different rules. It's not something I would like to do. It would be better to have a, a single name for a group of elements. So there are several unrelated elements that they want to apply unrelated because they may be in different parts of the page for which I want to apply the same rules. And this can be done with the class attribute okay class attributes can may can be added uh, so the id and the class may be added to any html elements always and the class is extremely useful uh, we can call it uh, a name for example again any id that we want and uh, the difference between class and id class is that ID must be unique inside the page while the class may be applied, a given class name, a given class identifier may be applied to many elements in the same HTML page. So it's a category, it's a group, it's the name of a group of elements. And it justifies the fact that we can select the elements by class dot is the syntax for identifying a class name I want to make all the elements in the page marked with the class name with the uh, font style oblique I So the hash sign selects an ID, the dot symbol selects a class. And uh, here we go. Of course, we could have used the I tag in HTML for creating the italics here. But we don't want to do that. We want to have in the XML the raw content, and then so we can choose and change the styles later on how we want. As long as we have put into the HTML the sufficient information that we can use to hook into the page and find the right spots that we want to manipulate. So we create a content and we define names, classes, IDs, sections in order to be able to apply selectively to different parts uh, the kind of effects that we want to achieve. And of course this, so, okay, so uh, we in sort of Create the content and plan ahead for later applying the style to that content. And as it happens, maybe we later discover that we want to apply a content to a part of a page and we need to mark it in some way. So mark it in some way means enclosing into a larger element or putting IDs, adding IDs or adding classes and so on.
And all these selectors can be combined. So for example, if I wrote, sorry, class equal to name also in the heading of the table, that would make also the name here in italics uh, that maybe is not what I want. Having the class on that element may be useful for maybe sorting by name or whatever but not for applying that uh, effect. What, it, what is happening is that the selector of the rod is too broad. Uh, it's selecting all the classes, but I really only wanted the table data with uh, the class name. Uh, so the uh, general form of selector is uh, an element name, a tag name, td now div main h1 followed by possibly one or more classes dot name followed by one or more ids but when we have an id usually it's already picking up one element so all the rest so we have a syntax where we can combine all the filters so i only select those tds who have a class name not everything that has a class name. And in this case, it will apply only to this element, and the, but this, the name will still have the, have the class uh, name class attached to it and can be used like, for, for other purposes. So it's a matter of uh, marking up the different parts of the page according to their role for their meaning and uh, writing selectors that uh, highlight uh, those parts that are more that that we want to change there will be also another way of doing some uh, change to a specific element i only mention it but uh, don't learn it would be to use a style attribute on the element itself In the HTML page, ID marks an ID, class marks a group, styles, style applies directly a rule. So I want this uh, to be uh, in boldface uh, font uh, weight uh, bold. Lighter, it's already bold, so I make it lighter. So it's like creating a specific ID for this element and applying these rules to that. And it works uh, by selecting that element and uh, you know, applying the style to the element itself. I don't like it very much as a solution because it mixes content with styles. Because right now in the HTML, we have the style definition for the element themselves. And we, if we want to change something globally, redesign the page, we need to go there in many different places. Otherwise, right now, all the styles are already in the CSS, are all in the CSS files. If we change the CSS file, then we can re redesign the, totally the visual aspect of the, of the page. Mm. So that's why I mentioned that for completeness, but I would uh, suggest against the usage of the style, excepting you know, particular cases or conditions, especially when we are we are going to dynamically change in Java, with JavaScript the style of a given element. But that's for next week. Okay, so this was the easy part, basically. Getting familiar with selectors, uh, and uh, in the CSS uh, slides, uh, I remember we have a Table with, uh, yeah. yeah, with the selectors that can be applied. I can select by class, by ID, by element name, and I can combine these selectors together with a space uh, for containment. P inside div. We had uh, the H one inside main. 
uh, with a comma that this, the union of the two selections select so we want to apply a set of rules to different elements so one selector comma another selector will uh, say uh, unite the two uh, elements uh, um, the greatest direct sign is like the space uh, where the second element is inside the first the difference is that the space is transitive so anywhere inside the first and the second is just a direct child uh, immediately after plus is mean uh, after so an element uh, which is right after the other or so but there are uh beef after and before the plus and the tilde uh, selector they are not very used but basically this is a language of, of selectors and uh, element class id and we may also filter on attributes so only those uh, uh, elements that have a specific uh, link or a specific attribute and so on mm -hmm. so of a language of selector and then you have the the properties which are don't have let's say a very complex language by themselves but uh, where is that okay I, I, no sorry I, I remember i had a page with a list of the properties but uh, it's here no it's too uh, not this one Yeah, uh, the number of properties we may apply on a given element or a set of elements is huge. Uh, this page of CSS property, you see that it's, it's infinite, basically. Uh, for uh, we have different groups of properties, uh, and uh, uh, e each of them have uh, so that uh, can be ordered by categories, animation properties, background, so everything to change the background, background as a solid color, as an image, uh, for making borders around elements. Uh, colors was the, si the simple one, okay? For changing the size of an element, making it bigger, smaller, the, the, we are going to see this part flexible layout in a moment. Uh, for changing the font, uh, for the size of the family, so the character type, um, for changing the margins. We mentioned initially that the navbar had some margins that we wanted to remove, and so on. So hey, we, we, that, we, we are never going to, to learn all of them. Basically, it's uh, the job. OK, people are, which are visual designers usually know a lot uh, deal about all these properties. But We'll try to learn and use the, the ones that are more uh, frequent hmm? because there are really a lot of them and they interact in strange ways sometimes. And not all uh, um, properties can be applied to every element. So only some type of elements can be can have some properties and so on. Hmm? But let's not get scared by that. OK, uh, the interesting part. So right now changing the color or the font of an element uh, is uh, relatively easy. The interesting part comes uh, when we are using uh, CSS properties for layout. Um, the idea is uh, that inside the browser, there, is, there are several layout algorithms that start from the tree of nodes in the HTML and try to decide the size and the position of each of these nodes on the page. There are different algorithms that are working together in different parts of the page on different types of elements. And uh, through some CSS properties, we can influence how these alg which algorithm we want to apply and uh, how it works. So we are not in charge of directly positioning elements on the page. That's the job of the, of the browser. We are in charge of changing or instructing the algorithms that are doing the layout by telling them what we want to achieve, by 
customizing their behavior. All of this is based on the so-called box model, which is what we also see here in the browser. Where is the browser? Okay, we see here this so-called box model, no? which is a strange picture here. What does it mean? It means that the layout algorithms uh, always convert every element in the page into the same uniform representation for the purpose of layout, a box. And a box has a, is, a, say, designed as a set of nested rectangles. We have an inner rectangle, which is the actual content. Maybe in this picture is clear. The content. So the content of a, of a, maybe, yeah, let's select this simple, simple line, left column here, OK? So this element. Uh, has a content which is 431.5 pixel wide times 19 height. This is the actual size of this content. The size of the content depends on the type of element. In this case, uh, it's an aside element, which is behaves like a div. And so all these sectioning elements take the full width of the page. So even if the real text is shorter, then this element, uh, which is the aside element, uh, will take uh, the full width of the browser. If I change the width of the browser, of course, the width of the element changes. Some elements are smaller. Uh, for example, this table cell have a smaller size and the height and so on. OK, this, the size is usually determined by the type of element and the content of the element itself. Then we surround, and the, the type of element means uh, there are some full with uh, elements, like titles like sections, like paragraphs, and some elements that only take the space uh, that is dedicated for them, like, for example, a span. Like, uh, let's, uh, let's make an example. If I, just to have something to show you, uh, if the left column, I wanted to make column in, a, in bold, for example, just put a bold here. And we load the page. Okay, I have a bolt here. And if I select this word column, we have this B element that contains the word column. And the size of the box is only the, spi the space needed for containing the word. So we already learned that there are two types of, blo of boxes here types of blocks. One are so-called inline elements. An inline element is a part of the line. And it only takes the space that is needed for its content. And the other are block elements that takes the full line, the full width of the, of the line of the space that we have. Some elements, by default, are, and they apply different uh, layout algorithms. Inline algorithm, inline elements, sorry, like this B, uh, lay out from left to right. And when they finish the page, they wrap on the next line, like letters do. Block elements lay out from top to bottom, and they never are laid out side by side, but always one after the other. So these are two of the basic layout algorithms uh, 
that we have. All uh, the browser says, okay, I have a series of uh, block elements. Okay, let's put them one below the other. Okay, I have a series of uh, inline elements. Let's put them in a you know uh, left or right manner. And of course, uh, inline elements uh, can be inside block elements, but the reverse is not possible. You cannot put a paragraph inside a word. So there are some some rules of that. These are just the formalization of the of, a, of the normal structure of a text. Okay, so everything is broken down into boxes, and there are at least two steps in this argument. One is figure out the boxes, and the other is lay out laying out the boxes, one relative to the other. So this box has this real content. Around the box, why do, we, why do we have so many rectangles? Because around the box, uh, there are several other areas. One is called the padding area, the border area, and the margin area. So apart from the size of the box itself, which is only determined by the content of the box uh, and by the fact that it's in line or block, uh, we can add more space the the same element may take more space if we want by defining some padding area or a border area or merging around it what are the differences between these three elements these three areas a padding is sort of a part of the element A border is something that we can draw around the element. But if I change the border here, you see it will create a box around it of one pixel wide, or maybe seven pixels wide. And so the box will be a thick line there. So every element, uh, by default, has a border around it. And the border may can be made visible if we change the thickness of the border, the size of the border. By default, it's, it were, it, they were all zeros here. So all these paddings, margin borders, usually by default are zero, but we can change them. Of course, we well, are changing them, uh, say, directly here, but of course, uh, we have uh, all the CSS properties, border, top, width, seven pixels that we can modify through a CSS file. OK, is this border too attached to the text? We can give it more hair with a padding. For example, we pad it two pixel on the four sides. So the border will stand a bit aside from the real content. And if we want to make the elements Separated from the rest, we can also work on the margins. Left and the right margins. If I highlight the element, you see that it's shown with the different colors too. So a margin is a safe area where the other elements cannot enter. Outside the element. If we think of the coloring, so if we had a background color of the element, which is different from the background color of the page, think of the padding of having the same color of the element itself, and the margin having the same color of the container of the environment in which the element is put. OK? So a lot of games can be played with this for having different visual aspects and different spacing, different alignment. Uh, usually, a box will take only the space that is needed, that it needs. Well, we can also change the, no, no sorry, not here, the minimum, there's a property that's called the minimum width. But we want to have maybe all the elements with a given width and they'd be all the same. So we can play with these properties to have some maybe nicer alignment and so on. So, all, every element in the page is converted to a box. The box is sized according to 
the CSS attributes, of course, that it may have, plus its nature, inline or block. And then the boxes are, so you can set all of these properties, and for the padding, you can change not only the size, but also the color with the background properties. So background applies the padding and the color. The color of the merging cannot be set by the element because it depends on the surrounding element. So it's transparent from the point of view of each element. The color of the border can be set independently from the color of the background. And also the width and also the style. The border can be dotted, it can be dashed. That's all possibility. And all the four uh, sides can be set independently from each other. So we have maybe too much control than we want. And this is the basic, uh, the first step of the layout algorithms. Then, uh, so creating uh, the boxes for each element and uh, preparing a layout uh, using the display properties of the blocks themselves. We mentioned inline and block. Inline, left to right, inside the single, uh, the single row of text. Uh, block one after the other. And this will be the default uh, layout as we see it, we, if we don't change anything. But to make, uh, and it will be normal, like you know, an, a word page, huh? where you have the text and you put a new line, you create a new block and you write the next line, and inside every line you can form the text, you can insert, insert a picture, insert a symbol inside the line. But if we want to change it, so make it two column or make some picture aside, uh, besides the text or, or something like that, we, sh we will apply other layout instructions on top of the basic board. So that's why I was, I, I mentioned before, having more than one layout algorithm. First, the browser will apply the basic algorithm, and then we'll apply other more sophisticated mechanisms. And uh, across the years, there were many different um, methods, different uh, layout algorithms that were developed. Starting with the first one was based on the plot property. Okay, all these algorithms are running in the browser, and I can control them by setting CSS properties. Okay, so the, uh, how I use them is always the same way. I set in the properties so that an element will be laid out in a different way. Historically, the first uh, layout option was using the float property. It is uh, somewhat, seems easy to understand, but it's very complicated to use. Uh, I just show you one slide here. Yeah, this uh, float, uh, floating uh, layout algorithm was based on uh, one, two attributes, basically uh, position and float. Position uh, is an attribute that it can be used to change the position of a box. So by default, maybe you have three inline elements that we lay out from left to right. We have a, you can have a, a, you can change the position of an element by providing a, an offset from the position in which it would have been. Or by providing an offset compared to the container element, the element that contains it. Or relative to the browser window. So this is the trick for making something fixed in the corner of the browser, even if you scroll the page, because you are transforming the layout algorithm is no longer left to right, but can be left to right plus an offset or left to right. And this is outside the normal flow and we put inside the container box and so on. And this was combined, it could be combined with a float attribute that took a, a block and uh, said, okay, this block will float to the left or to the or to the right, 
in the center was not used basically of the rest of the text so that was the effect where you can have a picture here floating left and the text that runs around the picture so we have the normal layout inline layout of the text plus a picture which is not blocking the text but it's outside the um, the flow uh, of the, the inline flow itself okay so it creates an effect like this so this is easy to achieve but then when we want to use these properties to create maybe a column not just an image inside the text that was the purpose by which it was invented then people started to create uh, layouts using these properties for example uh, this kind of layout left bar right bar and so on using these uh, float properties so in a way abusing for that algorithm for doing something more complex uh, rather than just uh, flowing around the picture and that created it was possible that uh, you had a lot of uh, um, tricks for doing that uh, something floating left and right and both uh, and there was a, a there were a lot of issues and bugs with this uh, approach because it was very difficult uh, to have. There was no way, basically, having the same size of the elements, the backgrounds uh, uh, could not be done unless you did a lot of fighting. So um, what it happened is that people tried to find uh, easier ways of, um, of doing layouts. Floats are still there, but they're a very low-level mechanism, and they're very complex to use if you if you want it uh, if we want to use it for you know, structuring the, the page. Uh, and so the second uh, say trick uh, were a second set of attributes and a new say uh, layout algorithm was defined that was called uh, the grid based on the grid model okay uh, the grid model is based uh, or it's useful for creating a say, grid based layout as the name says where you have a fixed number of uh, lines and columns so you divide a part of the page with a grid it's not just uh, like we use a table that contains data we are using a uh, grid as a reference uh, you know, like a newspaper, uh, you have a grid of columns and each column can contain text or pictures, maybe a picture can span two grids, uh, two, so two columns or three rows uh, because it's large and so on. It's a way of composing the page. With a rigid way, because actually it's row times columns uh, layout, you cannot do anything stranger, but it's quite flexible and easy to use. Uh, because basically you create an element, you define how many rows and column, columns that element uh, uh, will have, will contain, and then you have all the children of this grid container where you can specify if you want the, the number of column and row where it should be put. Okay, so I have, for example, an example of a layout of a, with a site with a header content and the left and right sidebars. Uh, what you say is that uh, the whole section is a grid. Section is the container, like in the HTML here, that contains everything. So I have a container and I want to apply the grid, the layout algorithm, on that container. So the container here, section, it just display grid changes the layout. So display inline, display block, and now we have display grid. We apply a different algorithm there. And all the children of the section that are these uh, header, navigation, article, side, and footer will be laid out into cells of this grid. And uh, which cell okay we are grid column and grid row that will tell the layout algorithm in which row and column the element should be positioned so it's much easier 
you set a container, you define the number of row and column of the container. In this case, it all, we also, it's also setting the size of these columns. Um, 100 pixels for the first column, 200 pixels for the last column, and 100% uh, of what remains uh, for the middle column. FR is a flexible measure that uh, one means 100% uh, of the container. And the same for the eighth. So 50 pixels at the top, 50 pixels at the bottom, and everything else in the middle. So for creating layouts like this, it's very easy because you just define a grid, specify the, the, the sizes of the rows and columns, and uh, position the element by setting this simple attribute. And if you don't set these attributes, it will just use the next uh, available cell. So you will fill it one by one in, uh, in the normal way. So you, it's very explicit. Uh, it's quite high level. If you need, to, if we need to have a layout like this, uh, then the grid uh, is uh, uh, it's useful. It's also very powerful. We'll see more. But I only gave some some hints about that. We will see more detail about the flex algorithm. Because it's the algorithm that will be used by um, CSS library that I'm going to show you in the, in the next hour. Okay, so again, as always happens, uh, we try to learn and understand the basics uh, and then try to find maybe there's already a library that solves a lot of low level issues for us. Okay, we don't have to decide every font, every size, every margin of every element because I understood how it works, but having something that works well together. It's a lot, of, a lot of work and a lot of pain. So we'll uh, learn a bit more about the flex algorithm and see the library, CSS library, which is called uh, Bootstrap, that uh, uh, is based on this flex algorithm. So we understand how it works, uh, and it will make our life uh, much easier, and we we'll try to always work with a library. Bootstrap is one. There are several others. Uh, so you can, if you want to, <laughs> to, to dig out and use something else, uh, you are free to, to explore, uh, but at least uh, a lot of property will be set for us just by applying high level classes. But this is for the next hour. Okay, so let's make some 15 minutes of break or something like that. Let's 